Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the director of Praxis, and today we are very fortunate to have with us Peter Barnes. He is a, an entrepreneur, an environmentalist, an author whose work has focused on the deep flaws of capitalism. He, some of his books include Capitalism 3.0, The People's Land, Who Owns the Sky, and his latest book, Ours, The Case for Universal Property, uh, will be published this July 2021. So we're getting a preview today. His proposal for a cap and dividend program modeled on the Alaska Permanent Fund could reduce greenhouse gas emissions and create a citizen's dividend for all Americans. Barnes contends that this proposal is more workable and sustainable than the cap and trade policies of the Kyoto Protocol. He's also the co-founder of Working Assets, Credo, a progressive communications company that donates to progressive nonprofits and has been doing so for years. Um, in 1995, Barnes was named Socially Responsible Entrepreneur of the Year for Northern California. And um, he sits on the boards of Greenpeace, Rainbow Workers Cooperative, the California Solar Industry Association, and several others. He's also the founder of the Mesa Refuge, a retreat for progressive writers and thinkers in Point Reyes. I've just finished reading Peter's book, uh, which I am just wowed by, quite frankly, uh, in pre preparation for uh, interviewing him today. He poses some very original yet inspiring and practical ideas for dealing with not only the climate crisis, but the economic inequality and how those two things intersect. So welcome, Peter. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, Georgia. It's really nice to be here. Uh, and I'm really happy that uh, I see some of my old friends on this uh, call as well. It's nice so, that we can all get together. It is indeed. And as well, I'm gonna ask, oh. go ahead. Well, I was going to, did you want to say something before I ask the first question? I don't, no. All right. Um, in your book, you wrote, the challenge of our era is to repair or replace capitalism before its cumulative harms become irreparable. And one of the things you've posed to deal with that is universal property being a hybrid model that we spoke about the other day. So could you explain to us what universal property means and what that would look like in dealing with flaw the flaws of capitalism? Okay, well, um, the first thing I should say about universal property is that it is a, I would say radically new concept, although it has historical roots, which I'll mention it. It's uh, originator was Thomas Paine, who wrote a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice in 1796, which essentially laid out the entire concept that, I, that I've just adopted for the 21st century. But the first point I'd make is that universal property itself is not an end, it is a means to an end. And the end that we are trying to accomplish is what everybody is really talking about and has been talking about for decades, which is how do we make markets? And I'm using the term market somewhat as a, uh, uh, a plug for capitalism, but markets are, are more generic. And we're gonna have markets. And, but the question is markets themselves are inherently flawed, at least the way they're structured now and their two most obvious and egregious and tragic flaws are that they incessantly widen inequality and at the same time, they incessantly destroy nature. So we know all of that. Um, and the question is, is there any possible way to fix these flaws short of some kind of a complete state control system, which is not something I uh, think would be a good idea. So to answer that question, to come up with a solution to this dilemma, um, I thought it was necessary to go back to the base of our market economy, which is property rights. And property rights have been around a long time. 
Uh, they have a particular form today, which I think is the cause of these twin catastrophes that we're entering. Um, but there are other possible arrangements of property. And um, my, so when people talk about public policy nowadays and all the problems we're so familiar with, they never talk about property rights. They only talk about, oh, well, maybe we need another government program here, or we need a tax here, or, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, you know, that's basically the, as far as things go. And so my first point is that unless we get into the, the base of the economy, which is this web of property rights that underlies it, uh, we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, property rights in our economy are kind of like gravity in the universe. They're just everywhere and they bend things so that things flow in their direction. That's what they do. They tug, they have these tugs that dominate everything. So universal property is a way to use the structure of property rights, inject it into markets and tug markets in different directions from the direction that private individually owned and inheritable property tugs markets. Um, so what would it actually look like? Well, um, the key features of universal property are, first of all, it's universal. Everybody gets it, it's a birthright. Uh, one person, one share, you have it, you can't trade it. When you die, it goes away with you. That's looking at it uh, at the individual end. At the larger end, what's involved is taking a lot of wealth that exists. It's not a question of the wealth not existing. It's a question of the wealth of wealth that exists not having any property rights at all at the moment. And that wealth is what I call co-inherited wealth. It has two parts. One is all the gifts that we receive from nature. And the other uh, is all the gifts that we receive from society, from our ancestors, all the things that we as humans and Americans in our case have built up over centuries. These two baskets of gifts are enormously valuable. They add more wealth and well-being to our economy today than all the efforts of Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and, and capital in general. Um, it's truly where our wealth comes from, yet it is not even visible in markets. It is like the black matter of the universe. Uh, and the fact that it is invisible, the fact that it is unpropertized and un responded to in markets is actually the at the root of those two problems that we were just talking about. The reason nature gets uh, destroyed is that nature has no property rights which could be used to protect itself. And the reason wealth concentrates is that a lot of the value that flows to the top 1% is through various clever machinations uh, under capitalism is essentially extracted from this invisible co-inherited wealth that rightfully belongs to all of us. So what we're trying to do with universal property, just to sum it up, is, is to kill two birds with one stone. Um, on the one hand, we want to put boundaries around nature and do it through property rights as opposed to government programs. And if you want me to explore that a little more, I'd be happy to. But that's the one uh, part of the, uh, the two parts that we're dealing with. In terms of inequality and giving everybody a basic income, although I don't, wouldn't call it that necessarily, what, what I'm saying is that if we co-inherit this wealth, you know, an inheritance is a nice thing. Every baby should have an inheritance. Uh, and 
it can be done. We can, in fact, make every baby a trust fund baby if we organize this currently unorganized wealth and hold it in trusts. And then the babies, all of us essentially, uh, get an income from that trust, like an annuity or just a stream of dividends. And if you're familiar with the Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, that is a living example of, of what I am talking about, where a, a, a fund, uh, which is originally capitalized by the oil that was uh, found on uh, Alaska's state lands, is invested. And every year there are dividends and they're distributed equally to every Alaskan. So it's taking a co-inherited asset that belongs to everybody, monetizing it, and sharing income from it for everybody uh, for their entire lives. So that's a relatively short answer to the question of what is universal property? That's, yeah, it's pretty involved. Um, yeah. I wanna bring up a few things that you mentioned in the book that I, I think are interesting. And one is you were touching on some of the limits that should be put on the market, which I think we talked about in Kate Raworth's diagram. I don't know if, John, do you have that diagram? Yeah, I do. I can put it up anytime. Okay, I'll, let's just wait because I want to ask a couple of things first. Um, one of the things you noted is that the corporations have assumed the rights of personhood and that why wouldn't it be possible for nature to have the rights of personhood, which I think is a really interesting idea. Uh, and Ecuador tried to put that in their constitution, I think. I don't know that it's worked out very well, but but it's an interesting idea. And I wondered if you would like to comment on that and how that might actually happen. Well, I, in theory, I'm all for the rights of nature. I mean, that's partly what this is all about, how to give nature um, the, the right to protect itself. But what I'm proposing is slightly different than if I, I can get into some of those weeds, you'll perhaps see where I'm thinking. The, the, idea of an abstract right of nature or the right of a river or something like that, or a species or trees, is usually proposed as a means to give these natural entities standing in a court so that they can sue in order to protect themselves against, you know, destruction or something. Um, I don't think that actually works. Um, and I'll try to explain why. Uh, it's somewhat analogous to the public trust doctrine for those of you who have heard about that, where supposedly the government is supposed to sue on behalf of nature. It rarely does, but it's, it's the same model. It, it's based on giving entities a right to sue generally after damage has already occurred. What I'm proposing is not so much that nature or river become a legal person, but that a trust, which is a fictitious legal entity that humans have created and you know, over a thousand years ago, it's nothing new. And the key to a trust, what makes it different from a corporation, let's say, which is also a fictitious person that's been around not quite as long, but what is special about a trust is that it is based on something called fiduciary responsibility. So the, the idea of a trust is you've got beneficial owners and you've got an asset, and then you've got a trust which manages the asset on behalf of specified beneficial owners. So it is a living entity like a corporation that has a board, it has employees, it has property rights, it has all of that stuff. It's not just um, you know, making nature a person in some abstract way. It's creating an actual agent that owns property and can act in the marketplace. But the way, the, the kind of property the trust owns and the way it acts in the market would be very different from the way corporations act and from the property that corporations own and from the whole point of corporations. The point of the trust would be to protect an ecosystem let's say the atmosphere. And uh, in order to protect it, the trust would have, would own property rights. In this case, um, it would be the right of 
human entities to dump wastes into the asset we refer to as our atmosphere. It's kind of like a conservation easement. It's not saying that the trust owns the atmosphere. Uh, you could, but that's going a little far. All we're saying is that the trust is a bit like the Marin Agricultural Land Trust, to give one local example. The Marin Agricultural Land Trust doesn't own all those farms in Marin. What it owns is, a, is conservation easements so that the ranchers can't do anything except agriculture. So it's kind of a property right, but it's a negative property right that gives the trust the ability to say no or to limit what's done on the underlying property. So uh, if you're following me thus far, uh, the, the distinction then between the right of nature and a trust that is set up to protect a natural asset is that the trust is there all the time. It's working day and night to protect that asset. It's also making revenue money, for example, by if, if people do pollute, they're gonna have to pay, which they haven't uh, done in the past which uh, is part of the process of, of, of phasing down pollution is to make people pay for it, corporations pay for it, um, which gives the trust an income stream, which can then be used, as I said, to accomplish the other purpose of universal property, which is to give everybody an income stream for life. So does that clarify or help clarify the difference between giving nature a property right or a right to sue and having a, a trust that can administer pro property rights in real time in order to protect nature. I think this is an excellent um, explanation of exactly the difference between those, because a lot of people have talked about uh, the rights of nature since the Ecuador constitution adopted that. So this is, I think you've made it really clear the difference in how much more effective this could be, because that hasn't worked <laughs> for one thing. Um, I'd like you to talk about the, um, some of the ways we might structure this or how it might work. You mentioned toll gates yes. and rationing, uh, how rationing might work and how people don't like that word necessarily, but how important it is to measure these things in a way that respects nature, res respects these limits that we have. Um, so I'd like you to talk about that. And then there's another part kind of related to that, which is uh, you made a, a note of we have a glut of goods. We have yeah. a glut of supply. Um, the supply is far greater than the demand. And how can we get that more in balance? Because that's another thing that I find very difficult to deal with because the, the glut of supplies means everything's cheaper, yep. which means there's more consumption. And the more consumption there is, the more the destruction of the environment there is. So how, how do you see that in relationship to um, the universal property rights? Well, I think you have two questions there. So um, yeah. the, the first question was about um, rationing versus what I call toll gates. Mm -hmm. um, well, just to back up even further, what we're trying to do is limit human economic impact on nature. So somehow we have to develop a mechanism to make humans behave in ways that don't destroy nature. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to think about that or to approach it. One is rationing. I mean, when we had to limit our use of resources during World War II, we set up a rationing system. This is an old thing and it, in World War II, which I'm just barely old enough to remember those little tokens that were uh, being used. Uh, the government, you know, sets a total limit and, and then gives uh, these coupon books to everybody. And when they go buy groceries or gasoline, uh, they have to give money and coupons. And um, so that's a kind of a complicated system, which uh, we have used in the past. Um, it's good for short term emergencies when when an economy really has to deal with something and they just need a way to limit use uh, for a few years. But uh, it's probably not a permanent solution uh, to what we ha have to do to limit the amount of human destruction of nature. So 
a simpler, I would argue, and, and more effective way to accomplish that goal of limiting harmful human activity is to install what I call toll gates. If you, let me back up to that diagram that, that uh, we haven't shown yet, but there's this English economist named Kate Rayworth or Raworth, uh, who has come up with a really nice visual metaphor of, of what we need to do to save the planet and ourselves. And, and basically it's a, a donut. And the donut has an inner uh, boundary and an outer boundary. And she says, if we think of our economy, uh, whether it's capitalism or whatever it is, our economic activity as being bounded by an outer border. Uh, there we go, thanks. Yeah, great. Um, which is our ecological ceiling. We have to keep our economy within that ecological ceiling. And a, a base, a foundation, if you want to call it, uh, which is uh, sort of s socially driven. There's some floor below which we, we must never allow any members of society to fall. So that's kind of the social foundation. So how do you do that? that this is the interesting question. If we just have markets uh, as we do now, there, there, there's nothing that uh, either constrains us uh, from hurting the biosphere or lifts up the bottom of society. There's nothing there, really. So um, maybe uh, while I'm on this thread, then you can switch to the uh, another slide, which shows toll gates. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm essentially saying um, is that we need two things on the boundaries of this donut. One is we need some kind of a mechanism, which I'm calling a toll gate. And that's sort of a metaphor where we can go into how it would work. But the basic idea is we need something at that outer boundary between markets and the biosphere where we can control the flow from markets into the biosphere or vice versa, depending on what, whether it's extraction or, or, or uh, pollution. Um, and the, I, the reason I call these things toll gates is that they have two functions. One is to say, okay, no, uh, you can't come in uh, based on the total capacity uh, of the biosphere in this case. Uh, and the other thing they do is say, okay, if we do let you in, uh, you're gonna have to pay. And that price uh, ideally would be based on what is the remaining capacity in the biosphere for accepting more carbon or any other uh, pollutant and or more deforestation, et cetera. What is the capacity? So that has to drive the setting of the toll gate. And um, then the price that is charged at the toll gate, which is paid not by the individual consumer as in rationing, but is paid by the upstream, the, the big corporations who are at the top of the system who are moving the stuff over that boundary, they pay it. Of course, they pass on the price as a cost. Uh, so the consumer ultimately pays it, but the consumer doesn't have to worry about uh, keeping all these little coupons and everything. They just pay whatever the market price is. Anyway, that's the toll gate. And that's how we make our our market align itself with nature. And then the money pumps in, in the inner circle, um, those are mechanisms which, of which the Alaska Permanent Fund is, is an example. But what they do is, and there's a variety of ways they could be structured, but their function is to pump money into the economy, collect it, pump it back into the economy universally. So, it's like a, a, a garden irrigation system that irrigates all the plants in a garden equally, as opposed to just the big plants. So I'm basically saying that we need those two features. We have to add those two features to markets, the toll gates vis-a-vis -vis the biosphere and the universal money pumps vis-a-vis -vis society. And where universal property comes in is that 
using universal property is a way to build those two things, the toll gates and the universal money pumps. Great. These are really good examples, good graphics. Um, you want to stop the screen share, John? I thought I did, but maybe I didn't. Um, and I have one last question before we go to questions from our audience here. You mentioned the Overton window in your book also, which is, um, we've had other speakers refer to this, which is a time where politicians, or it shows what the parameters are of what is realistic to be done during a particular time. And now that we have Biden as president, and he's made quite a few very interesting and progressive um, statements lately and changes lately to Trump's policies, uh, how do you see that for us and for some of these ideas that you're putting forth? How do you think we might be able to push on our legislators to look in this direction? And have any of them actually asked you for your input? Well, um, not in, the, in, in response to the last question. Nobody related to Biden uh, has asked me anything. So Shocking. No. Um, but... Um, Yes, the Overton window is this notion of, okay, there's this window of, of what is politically feasible and all the ideas that we talk about are never within that window. But the window does shift and I guess you're uh, over time and usually it's because of a combination of public pressure and perhaps crises that are externally created. And, and I think that's both of those factors are in play now. And I think the Overton window is shifting uh, whether it's shifting far enough and Biden is, whether Biden is going to be able to, you know, work within an enlarged Overton window in the next few years, I don't know. I'm somewhat skeptical. I, don't, I wouldn't place too much hope on that. What I do place um, slightly more hope on is uh, another crisis, I hate to say it, uh, which moves us beyond this sort of Overton window, uh, uh, you know, window of opportunity to a whole other window of opportunity, which um, some systems thinkers call uh, the adjacent to possible. The adjacent possible is a little further ahead of the curve than the Overton window. And it's an interesting theory. Um, it says that when uh, that, that complex systems are always things going on and they go in and out of equilibrium and eventually they reach some kind of crisis or tipping point where uh, either they die or they shift. They make a, a quantum leap or something to another phase. And there are only a relatively small number of phases a complex system can leap into. And that's what the adjacent possible is all about. There may be three or five adjacent possibilities to our current system. And um, I think, you know, this sort of hybrid market-based system, which includes corporations as well as universal property, it's a hybrid in that sense, is something that is arguably uh, within the adjacent possible. Maybe it's slightly outside the Overton window, but it's within the adjacent possible. And we can have a longer discussion of what it takes to get from where we are today into a new adjacent possible, but that's that's how I see that. That's a really interesting concept in it, the adjacent possible. And maybe that's up to us and some of the more progressive people in the Senate and Congress to help spearhead these things. Yes. So I'm going to go now to questions from the audience who would like to, uh, first of all, do you know how to put your hand up automatically so that you don't have to wave your hand for 10 minutes? Um, <laughs> hopefully, if you don't know how to do that, just let us know and John can tell you how to do that. Yeah, basically, if you're in the window where you see everyone's face, you can hit the reactions button. Uh, you're going to see it down on the bottom uh, along your participants, chat, share screen, record those buttons. You can click the reactions and then click raise hand. Otherwise, I'll do my best to catch you guys raising your you know, physical hands on the camera. Um, and you might also be able to just put something in the chat box, too. So uh, I'm will. looking now for. Yeah, Gus is first, it looks like. OK, yes, good. Gus, go ahead. Gus? Where is he? He's muted. Oh, Gus, you need to unmute yourself. 
Usually people want me to shut up. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a little off the main topic, but very relevant to the adjacent possible. And that's another way to, to link this idea with another idea many progressives are concerned with, and that is reparations. The argument about, we all have heard various versions of it. I don't like any of them. I think they're intrinsically divisive, but they point to a genuine problem. And as I was looking at Peter's ideas, I was thinking, what the people who immigrated here after slavery was gone and may not be wealthy also contributed to social wealth, as did the slaves. And so this can be looked at as a way to address the long-term systemic uh, impact of slavery and racism in the many ways, in the many horrible forms it's taken in this country. They could be linked. And that would make each. I would think more um, popular with people who might otherwise not be so concerned. I wonder what Peter thinks of that. That's all I have to say. Okay, well, just briefly, I don't wanna take more time, but uh, I don't get into reparations in my book and I, I have the same hesitancies about it that you do. Uh, the, my preference, it's not that I'm against reparations, but the reason I'm advocating universal property is I think it's really important to, bring, to treat everybody equally. We're all in this boat together and we've got to establish that. And anything that adds more divisiveness, even if it's for a good cause like reparations is, is troubling. Uh, we have too much divisiveness and we need something that builds solidarity. I have one thing I want to ask and then I'll go to Jerry. Uh, when you said that we all would be treated equally, well, we all aren't beginning equally. So someone who has a billion dollars would still get the same amount of universal income as someone who has uh, a minimum wage. That seems very unfair. How would you deal with that? All right. Well, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that is what Republicans and, you know, all sorts of people say, even liberals. Um, it, it's not as well, that is one reason I talk about inheritances as opposed to a universal basic income. Uh, in other words, people in America in particular find it hard to understand why anybody should get money for not working. They think the only way that uh, uh, people should rightfully get money is to earn it um, or inherit it. We like inherited money. So uh, I'm saying, okay, uh, let's talk about inheritance and not government handouts. I'm not for government handouts, I'm for inheritances, equal inheritances. Now, does this mean that billionaires will, let's say it comes to $10,000 per person per year, just for sake of argument. So yes, Bill Gates would be eligible to get $10,000 just like the rest of us, um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, if you worry about money going to billionaires who don't need it, I'd say two things. First of all, they probably wouldn't opt in, you know, that you don't automatically get it. You have to register for it. And I'm assuming uh, billionaires wouldn't be bothered with something as trivial as $10,000. So they might not even get it. Uh, even if they did get it, um, it would be considered taxable income. So roughly 40% of it would be recaptured. So the, the quote cost uh, would not be as big as, it, it would be trivial. By the time you figured out what the cost of doing, giving you know, one or 2% of the people money that they might not even collect and would then pay taxes on if they did collect, it's a trivial cost compared to the benefit of having a socially unifying system that lifts everybody and makes it possible, not just to reduce, if not eliminate poverty, but to have a large and secure middle class that is not based on means testing and picking winners and you know who's the deserving poor and all that nonsense. We've gotta get, not necessarily get rid of that. There is a place for 
means-tested benefits. But what I think we need is a combination of universal dividends or universal co-inherited income, on top of which we, can, we still need some means-tested uh, things and we need social insurance to adjust for unemployment and, and, and various other uh, insurable risks. Okay, I won't continue on it though. I would like to another time, but I want to go to other people with questions. So Jerry and then Ray will be next. Um, thanks, Georgia. So I really like your conceptual framework. What I'm struggling with in my mind is what are practical steps we could take to implement it. Now, I, I understand the Alaska oil fund as a a, a real life example. And um, I read your book about cap and dividend. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I understand that as basically a government operated program, you know, really part of a regulatory structure. I'm not sure, I, I'm having a hard time picturing in my mind creating the kind of trust you're talking about on some kind of larger scale. Okay, well, um, what I'm laying out is kind of a um, idealized vision. And I realize that in the real world, it may not take this exact shape. But um, in the, I, well, take the cap and dividend uh, model, for example, which, you know, um, I spent many years uh, promoting um, in its in its idealized form uh, it would not be a government program it would there would be a trust that is extra governmental it may be created it has to have authority granted by the government but it wouldn't be like EPA it would be more like the Fed let's say and uh, it would have authority to limit the uh, amount of carbon that enters the US economy. That's the, the sort of toll gate upstream cap model. And um, it would sell permits and it would distribute income and the government would be not, other than setting up this trust in the first place and endowing it with these property rights, uh, after that, the government would have nothing to do with this. Um, you know, that's in the ideal uh, model. In the real world, uh, that's not likely to happen. But, um, to, but, but to say there are models, you know, I mentioned the Maroon Agricultural Land Trust. There are many models of land trusts in the US and around the world that are sort of like this. So you can imagine it happening. And you can also imagine, I guess my, my mega fantasy would be that if you remember back to the 19th century when uh, the federal government uh, gave all this free public land to railroads so they could build railroads. Uh, and then in the 20th century, uh, the federal government gave the broadcast spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum to big uh, media companies so they could show us TV shows. Um, so this idea of the federal government creating property rights and then giving them away for, the, for some large public purpose uh, is not a, a new idea. It's happened before. So the 21st century equivalent that I'm proposing is that the government um, create what are essentially supersized conservation easements which don't exist at the moment, uh, but like a conservation easement for the atmosphere would say, you know, you can't do certain things uh, to the atmosphere. Um, and the government could create these property rights out of, you know, ex nihilo, nobody owns them now. So, and it could endow these trusts that are genuine fiduciary trusts accountable to future generations and, um, uh, and just make a huge 21st century 
railroad type grant of these conservation easements to a whole bunch of trusts that would then carry on the, the never ending task of putting these boundaries around our market economy. Great. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Ray, Cheryl, and then Bill. So Ray, you're up now. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I was kind of wondering in the context of all that, you know, we have the situation now where you just mentioned the railroads getting a giveaway. Well, we've got that in terms of basic governmental research. You know, I keep thinking of healthcare in particular, where these fundamental developments get handed out to the pharmaceutical companies who then turn around and bill us back for their advertising as if it were their R&D budget. Yeah. And that infuriates me. So how can we get, you know, I assume this would have to be at a government level distinctly that say that, yes, this is part of our commonwealth, the original concept here. And, and that when we do, we pay as taxpayers to do the basic research, then that becomes a licensing event out to companies who then, you know, pay us back or pay us, you know, a dividend that then kind of flows through this, I think, system you're trying to, to profile. Is that? That's, that's exactly right. That's another example. I mean, what, what I find interesting is that once you get this basic framework set up, there's all sorts of ways that it can be applied. And you've just come up with one and there's a lot more. It, it changes the way you think we think about markets and what is possible within the context of markets. Great. Uh, Cheryl, you're next. Cheryl, you need Hi, to this is George, Cheryl's partner. Hi, so I, I had a question and I'm very intrigued by the process, and, but I'm in agreement with you that this is a difficult transition to make since it's a whole new idea. And I was wondering if something simpler and more basic, like looking at a 10% tax, billionaires would pay billions, um, it would cross over on a line as you go down the tax scale with a just flat 10% and people under 100,000 or whatever cutoff is made would start receiving money. It would get rid of uh, as in the form of rebates, even though they don't pay anything right. of refunds. So you've got a system that then uh, does allow for the ultra wealthy to put in instead of dodging taxes through loopholes, put in actual money. And people at the low end of the scale would get money and they would then, there would be no homeless, no poor uh, in, in that sense, because they would, after that line crosses over, get refunds, which would effectively give them. So a flat 10% tax across a crossover threshold would seem to be a simpler thing to institute than a whole new structure with a whole new trust and a whole new system where there would be a lot of resistance. This would be something that would just simply change the current tax structure. Could that fit into your program? Uh, well, I'm not against it, but uh, I will say this. Uh, I, I've, over the years, adopted a somewhat skeptical uh, view of using the tax system as a way to redistribute income or wealth. And, and, and the reason for my skepticism, I mean, I'm all totally sympathetic with what you just proposed. And there have been ideas for the negative income taxes as a Milton Friedman proposed is pretty much what you just described. Um, but Having spent, you know, I'm, I'm not a spring chicken. I've been around a while and I've seen what happens when, um, you know, when Eisenhower was president, the, the highest uh, tax rate was 91%. And um, ever since then, and um, especially after Reagan and so forth, that tax rate has just gotten lower and lower and lower. 
So the problem that I have with using relying on the tax system to do what to redistribute income is that it is a very fickle politically. You can pass a nice high tax today, but 10, 20 years down the road, you can be almost certain that it will have been whittled down or avoided in one way or another. Whereas um, if you set up a system that's based on property rights, we own the oil or the atmosphere or the, the intellectual property, whatever these things are, um, those can't be so easily fiddled with. Uh, those are, are property rights, and uh, if they're here today, they're here tomorrow. I mean, that is one of the good things about property, uh, or one of the reasons property was created was so, and, and all these prohibitions on, on, on takings of property and, and stealing the property, you know, property is meant to endure. So I say, if the rich are relying on property to preserve their wealth, then all of us should rely on our universal property to preserve our wealth. Great. Um, Bill, you're up next. Yeah, I got Bill, then Ben, then yeah. Fran, then Allison. Right. So, Bill? Yeah, okay. So, Peter, I appreciate your comments a lot. A lot of good meat here. Um, I've always, probably like you, wondered about how do we get from here to there, uh, particularly when the very uh, current offenders are the ones that essentially own the government. And so therefore having great faith that perhaps the offenders in cahoots with the government will do something uh, contrary to what they have done in the past uh, is, um, as you say, it's, it's I'm skeptical. However, your concept of uh, adjacent possible, uh, you and uh, Stuart uh, Kaufman Yes. And the, our good friends at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I think there's a something of, of interest here uh, demonstrated by a couple of other things that are going on in the, the financial worlds at the moment. And that is if you say that in the world of adjacent possible, there has to be some forcing events. In other words, this doesn't happen just by itself. There has to be something, yes, we, we all know we're on the edge of uh, sort of chaos and it's on the edge of chaos where there's opportunity. Right. But even on the edge of chaos, there has to be a forcing event of some kind. Um, so perhaps with your concepts, um, one of the forcing events at, at the moment, uh, obviously is the wild printing of, uh, of, of currency. And so therefore uh, assets that are marked in fiat currency are, um, it, are losing the faith of the audience. The audience is losing faith in these. On the other hand, assets that are finite and cannot be expanded are gathering a lot of the faith of the marketplace. All the Bitcoin, which cannot be extended beyond 21 million shares or 21 million coins, uh, this is skyrocketing in value. So anytime you can lock something down that has a capped total, that value can skyrocket. So the idea would be somehow to appeal to the greed uh, of those that are not being charitable these days yes. and say, okay, here's another asset class uh, that you're not going to get uh, inflated. Uh, your assets are not going to get inflated away. And perhaps if you could align uh, the, the lower level interests of the greedy class uh, with the needs of, of the needy, <laughs> uh, perhaps you have got something that would fly. Well, I agree with that uh, analysis. That that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Okay. So I, then the question is, you know, how do you do that? You have, yeah. I, I think, to get the governments to agree is not realistic, uh, because among other things, this is an international problem, so not just a, a U.S. problem. So how do you get uh, U.S. and China to agree or, or whatever? I, I think you almost have to start down at individual. Uh, cryptocurrency-like organizations, which are global to start with, and that are not necessarily, they're distributed ledgers that are not necessarily attackable or controllable by individual governments uh, by themselves. Well, I'm gonna pass on cryptocurrencies because that's above my pay grade. Uh, and it's not part of what I have written about. So, but I, I think we're sympathetic uh, in, in general. Totally. Yeah. Just looking for a way to get it done. <laughs> yeah, well, we all are. That's that's the question. 
Uh, so people do do real estate trans or at least starting to on on uh, blockchain networks. There are some serious assets being traded and monitored on, um, you know, other than just uh, storage of values um, like Bitcoin is just a, a perspective a value proposition, whereas some people are using Ethereum or other such um, uh, distributed ledgers to um, transact in real estate or other financial yeah. means. Yeah, There's we don't want to go off into Bitcoin right now, John. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so Ben, you're next. Well, I I wanted to thank Peter. I really enjoyed uh, this uh, this presentation, and I some to some degree when I think you know I, these ideas are all very good ideas, and then I think about that contrasted against our actual <clears throat> political environment and where we. Uh, the pattern that we've settled into in the last 40 years in in um, American politics. And so, you know, it almost reminds me, like in the 19th century, they had this uh, theory called Georgism, which was a very clever idea about, you know, how you use it, which is, it would work, except for that there was no political will to adopt it. I sometimes feel the same way about MMT. It's like, yeah, it's right. But in the current environment, uh, you know, that's not going to fly in any time soon in Congress. So we have to, I, I, so the ability to put into policy at scale, these progressive policy initiatives is contingent. Not, I don't think it's as contingent on the will and determination of our progressive political champions as much as it is that the political system seems to have been broken <laughs> to some degree. And I, I don't know at this point without some orthogonal event that will, like you're talking about this, an additional crisis that yeah. may break open the stalemate. So I just want your assessment of what is the actual prospect of some of these initiatives being implemented in the near future? Well, it depends what you mean by near future. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it's been about 20 years. Let me just give you some historical perspective. Well, one example I often cite is social security, okay? Uh, social security was first passed in 1935 uh, as a result of, well, the depression, the, all the organizing that was going on in the 30s, and in particular, uh, something called the Townsend Movement, which was organized by uh, seniors who were demanding $200 a month uh, for people over 60. And it had a massive uh, base of support. And it pushed Roosevelt to have to come up with something. And what he came up with was Social Security, which compared to what the Townsend Movement was demanding, it was trivial. Uh, the first Social Security uh, system had a uh, a two percent payroll tax, and your benefit—you know, monthly benefit—was uh, in the range of thirty dollars a month. But what happened was, uh, once the pipes were created and people saw how the system worked and realized this is a good thing, we want more of this. Every five or ten years or so, you know, Congress kept upping the benefits and upping the payroll tax, of course, to pay for it until you know we now have a system uh, and a com you know we have medicare we have a whole bunch of things that are similar that together constitute about 10% of gdp so it's taken 75 years to get social insurance to a significant scale and it's not to say it shouldn't be even bigger than it is but what i'm saying is i think that we have to think in that way, at least in the context of the United States, that we need a starting version of this, which is relatively small, but is expandable. And once in place, you know, people are going to demand more. You know, people are starting to, when I first proposed cap and dividend, you know, way back in the early 2000s, people were interested in it from, for environmental reasons, they thought this made sense. But Nobody was interested in the dividend. That was just poo-pooed, even by progressives who said, 
Um, now we shouldn't be giving money to people. They're going to just spend it on beer and flat screen TVs. We should be investing it in, in good things. Um, now there is a realization that people need income. We also need public investment. I'm not against public investment, but there is a need that is massive for a steady base of income. And, and we're seeing, you know, Andrew Yang ran for president on that. There's all sorts of things happening now. People are demanding uh, cash. Just give us the money so we can pay our bills for crying out loud and not live on the edge of, of financial insecurity. This is what people want. So I think the demand uh, for some kind of universal income is there and it's growing and it's only going to get stronger because there's no alternative. Uh, the idea that we're gonna uh, make everybody economically secure through wages alone is just not believable anymore. Um, we need other income streams. And um, so this doesn't directly answer your question about how and when uh, all this is gonna happen, but I guess my two points are Number one, you need a couple of things. You need demand, uh, popular demand uh, growing over time. You need a crisis uh, which enables uh, something new like social insurance to make an entry. And then you need to grow over time. So those are the three components that I see as the path forward. It's not gonna happen in one fell swoop, uh, but it could happen over time. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good explanation. I, and it reminded me of um, back in the 1960s, Herbert Marcuse was talking about an, in, uh, a universal income and how that would be necessary at some point in time. Here we are 60, 70 years later, and uh, we're talking about it, but I think we're getting closer to it. And I remember being very struck by it when I first read that idea and what that might mean for humanity, basically. So I'm going to go to Fran next. We're going to, yeah, I think we have time for the next three questions. We have Fran, Allison, and Lori. So Fran, you're next. Thank you. Hi, Peter. It's great to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. After, got the brain <laughs> moving on the next thing. So, um, the question's but, mine, right? Well, you could have a question, no. but I have a question. <laughs> oh, I told her to put up the question because I had a question. I thought she was putting ah. it up for me. Oh. <laughs> uh, Georgia, may we have a twofer? You can have a twofer. You're louder than everybody else. I'm not quite sure why, but. So my question, uh, Peter, is how do we avoid getting people hooked on pollution? So. We give, let, let us take the Sky Trust and uh, we sell permits to oil companies or whoever it is, and then we get a dividend. We want that dividend. And so we want to sell permits. I, as a citizen, want my right. check and I want to sell those permits. How do we avoid hooking the people on pollution? Okay. Let, let, let me come in here because my question is basically in the same frame. Okay. <laughs> the basically, um, yeah, I mean, the fact you base it on the Alaska Fund, which is based on the extraction of oil, which is something that we have to move beyond a dependence on. You take the larger frame, we are currently in our overall human consumption, essentially dependent on 1.7 times what Earth's regenerative systems can sustain according to the Global Footprint Network. So we have to be moving to where we are reducing our total demand on nature while at the same time figuring out how to meet the needs of all the world's people. And I don't see how we can get there by essentially dividing, you know, if you're going to rate nature, uh, 
It's better that we share the, the financial benefits, but that ultimately is a path towards self-extinction. Um, and it seems to me that your, your, your plan totally ignores our, uh, our over-depend, our, you know, our, our, essentially our rape of nature. Okay, I think I will try to address both of your questions. I agree they're, they're linked. Um, I, I, I complete, well, David, I, I completely agree with your analysis that we have to reduce uh, our, our destruction of nature and setting up these toll gates is a way to do precisely that. It is not intended to uh, reward people for destroying nature. It is actually intended to reward people for preserving nature. And this goes to um, Fran's question. And here I must admit, it's a little counterintuitive. You have yeah. to- uh, How does that Alaska fund help move us off of our dependence on oil? Well, the Alaska fund does not, but a sky trust would. There's a big difference. Um, if in a sky trust, you're allow, you're cranking down, the whole purpose of the sky trust is to crank down the amount of carbon that enters the economy and subsequently the atmosphere. Uh, the, the way you get dividends, Fran, pay attention to this, this is economics. Uh, as you reduce the, the, the supply of carbon permits, but the demand for them you know, is still there, the price is going to go up. So you're, you're making money uh, by doing the right thing, not the wrong thing, is what I'm getting at. Uh, it's in everybody, it, what, what you're doing is aligning the interest of future generations with the interest of living generations, which are usually in conflict. But thanks to this weird phenomenon that when you make something scarce, its price increases, uh, we're capturing that particular quality of markets that scarcity raises price and using it uh, to transition out of excessive destruction of nature into, you know, where we have to be. Does that make sense? It's tricky. Yeah, but it, yeah it, it does. Although if we take the uh, carbon emissions, we actually want to bring them to zero. We do. So if we were to actually bring them to zero, then there aren't any permits. That's true, and that's fine. Th and there's no income. But then all well, those people hooked on the income is, is are, are going to say, no, 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 we still want some. Wait, let's keep Yes, the they will, and, and they should. But here's what would happen. Um, I would imagine that there's a social wealth fund, which is like a sovereign wealth fund, except that its earnings go to the people, okay? And uh, it would have a, a mixed portfolio of, of things in there. And it would start, I mean, where in the early years, a, a relatively large percent of its portfolio would be these pollution rights. And it would get a lot of revenue from that. But that would only be one of its assets. It would have a basket. And as this particular uh, asset disappeared, as it will, as you say, at some point there'll be zero emissions, um, fine. By that time, uh, the fund will have diversified into other things and people will still get their income. As it turns out, I mean, somebody mentioned uh, MMT. Um, most of the income that uh, I think would come out of this kind of social wealth fund would over time be socially created uh, wealth that was charged for rather than naturally gifted wealth. I think that transition would take a few decades, but we would get there. And money is a good example. There's a lot of uh, potential income that can be um, one way or another squeezed out of our monetary system and distributed directly to uh, individual people, as opposed to the way it works now, where quantitative easing for banks is what happens, as opposed to for people. So 
every all the income that we're talking about over time is a blend of a lot of different things and and the emission permits is only a small piece of that especially it gets smaller over time okay i'd like to go to allison next allison do you want to unmute oh yeah all of this ignores one basic reality you cannot eat money mm -hmm. right drink money you can't breathe money we absolutely mm -hmm. depend on the health of, of mm -hmm. nature systems, and we have to learn to live in a fundamentally different way so that mm -hmm. we maintain those systems while we meet all fundamental needs. And the, the, the focus that we get into on money, that if we just had enough money and we mm -hmm. distributed it equitably, everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. It simply does not work. I think what we're talking about and I, I, what you're talking about is the need for change in our lives, in the way we live and our values. And that is a whole other piece we haven't gotten into today, but it's a critical way We relate to each other and to yeah. nature in fundamentally different ways. We have to change, basically, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. And I think we all probably agree. Um, I'm going to go to Allison next. Thank you from the Cortez and thank you, Peter. It's been, I hope you can hear me okay because I'm yes. in my car and plugged in. Oh, good. Um, well, obviously there's a, there's a, this is an enormous piece and I've been pleased to hear some things and I'm glad you just said what you said, David, because I think that's speaking a bit to where I might be coming from with my question. And um, I think I, I'm curious because such wonderful radical ideas on how to create assets and what is not right now considered an asset and distribute. And yet this um, frame of continuing to talk about the economy within the existence of the same monetary system that is so extractive and destructive, right? You know, right now, what we're talking about is both liquidity, right, that medium of exchange, and also a store of value. And I find it interesting that I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to know where to go with my question because it's just such a big topic. I find that, yeah, why or maybe why are we not talking about different money systems? We are, we continue to talk about new ways of moving around this singular money that we have. When I, I think economic drawdown, for instance, of the, the we could say that we're using 1.7 planets and we have 10 times or more of our productive economy in the form of derivatives that are just siphoning life from the planet. So changing our behavior, yes, changing our worldview, yes, but if we continue to look at money as, as uh, something that's valuable because you have it or don't, it's Bitcoin and gold is the same. So how can we look at these assets? The universal property um, concept I find really sexy. And so how do we invest in that universal, the universal assets of life, draw down that wasteful money? Does that make sense? Are you going there with your ideas? A bit, Peter? Does well, yes. I mean, that would be what would happen if we had this system of toll gates on the outer boundary and universal money pumps near the inner boundary. That system, will, I mean, that's not enough. As, as you have said, and everybody has said, there's a lot more that has to happen. But um, what, what I'm saying is we want to structure something that will last, that will keep our economy within these boundaries of the donut. And if we do that, the details of how we live with each other, what, how we do agriculture, how we do transportation, how we do all these other things will play out. Uh, if we can't use oil, we'll use something else. If we can't use phosphorus, we'll use something else. Um, so that'll all happen. And we still need Green New Deals and all the rest of that stuff. But my um, belief is that we've got to set the boundaries first. Without boundaries, we're never going to beat what's going on. It's just too powerful. So uh, 
creating those boundaries, making them politically popular and defensible uh, is an absolutely essential first step. And then within the world that we create then, uh, we do all these other things, but it's so much easier to do all these other things because the bad things are being squeezed out and oh, people yeah. are being lifted up. So people will have more time and freedom and capacity to do the things that need to be done. They won't be just working three jobs to pay the rent. So we're gonna take one last question and that's gonna be from Lori. Well, Peter, it's uh, great to see you. Um, the earlier part of the uh, new millennium, I believe I was at one of your discussions, okay, in Marin and heard your concept from the very beginning. It's uh, great to hear it um, unfold, you know, through the 20s um, as well. I, I just wanted to say that, that um, you could take 365 days and take a new, a new path on any one of these issues and still not come to resolution. But as one who wishes to build consensus on an item, I think my biggest question is, is that an individual, whether it's a baby that's just born, whether it's a millennial, whether it's a senior citizen, whether it's elderly, has to understand the value of what this dividend is for them. And it has to be made meaningful yeah. because this needs to have legislation, correct? Yes. And it needs to be done not just on a state or, or county, state or federal level, but it has to be done on a universal level. So um, I just say it should be the Peter Barn uh, chip, okay, uh, for the monetary value, okay? And we go on from there and name it something universally that has uh, some indication that trades all over the world because um, our climate isn't just like right over our air or our space now. It's what people are doing in different parts of the world. And again, our other resources, which are limited, also are affected by what everyone does in their own particular space every day. So to me, it's like tracking, like this tracking system, okay, and who's eligible and and all the litigation that may come up from ownership with that. Um, just, just, do you have a piece of that that's kind of clarifying for me? Huh. Uh, let's see. I'm not quite sure uh, what, I, I share your goal, uh, I should just say, of simplicity, transparency, all those things, which will make whatever system we have understandable, popular, and, and, and durable. Um, I'm not quite sure how to specifically uh, address your question. Maybe you can just rephrase it slightly at the Well, end. I was going to say like what was brought up before was a social security number. Okay, yeah. so in the US, you know, dividends might be paid, accrued, or accounted for, right. you know, by your social security number. But right. that works mm -hmm. in the US. It right. doesn't work in other countries. Well, I think um, there's no way we're going to start down this path at a global level. Uh, it can only happen, you know, the most we can hope for is within a national level, or maybe in Europe, they can do things more collectively through the European Union, but that's it, you know, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, all these international things are um, essentially unenforceable, but um, what I can foresee is that if a couple of major economies like the US and the EU and maybe China uh, put in systems like this where they are limiting the physical, uh, let's say carbon, amount of carbon that their economies use and they're cranking that down and they're charging for it and they're doing all of that. Uh, and there's this one little piece that I left out because it's kind of wonky, but um, the, uh, have I hit a wrong button there? Um, yeah, uh, which is the, the border um, adjustment fee. I didn't mention that because it's too wonky, but the basic idea is if the US, let's say, has a carbon cap, cap which causes the carbon price to go higher, and then China wants to, doesn't have 
a carbon price. So in theory, it could uh, sell cheaper products in the US because it doesn't have to bear the cost of carbon. The border adjustment fee would prevent that. In other words, it would apply our price of carbon to. Oh, I accidentally muted Peter. Yeah, you're mute. OK, you're all right. Well, I'll just be brief. Uh, I was talking about uh, border adjustment fees. So we, we work within, say, Europe, the US, China, as opposed to some international treaty that's going to come into force all over the world in the single swoop. But these, these, these national efforts, are have, all of them have these border adjustment fees. So the effect of them is to make is to globalize what is done at a national level without having to have an international treaty. That, that's my point. Great. So Peter, are there, is there any idea you want to end with or thoughts you'd like us to know about before we close the program and finish with the recording? Well, I just want to thank you really for, for this very interesting discussion. Um, as I think, um, Georgia mentioned, my book isn't even out yet. It's not even <laughs> in the galleys. So uh, uh, I haven't talked about this ever <laughs> with anyone. I mean, obviously, this is related to ideas I've been working on for a long time. But this particular uh, version of it is new. And I haven't necessarily got all the answers at this point, uh, or even my elevator mm -hmm. speeches. Uh, but I have um, enjoyed this opportunity to get your feedback. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's, it's really been interesting. And I know a lot of us are going to be talking about this afterwards and, you know, getting ideas around it. So I'd love to have you come back when the book is out and help you promote the book. But it was wonderful to have you here today. So thank you so much, Peter, for your time and your wisdom. Well, thank you, Georgia. Thank you for inviting me.